Thank you for the privilege of being with you again. I've dedicated most of my life to studying exotic, dangerous diseases, rare diseases that are often devastating to the people who get them. Diseases such as river blindness and plague taking me to places that are not on anybody's bucket list. Sometimes having to shoo the kissing bugs off the bunk before I could go to sleep. And still, people were surprised and somewhat horrified that I was heading to West Africa in the middle of the worst Ebola outbreak ever. But early in my training, I had the privilege to work with some true heroes, such as Dr. Wayne Myers, an unbelievably dedicated, brilliant, and humble physician. You see him there carrying a chair I just haggled for in Accra, ever the gentleman. And there you see him as a dashing young doctor, recently married to his beautiful bride, Esther. Esther had been born in the Congo to a medical missionary, and she grew up to marry Wayne, a medical missionary, and together they dedicated their lives to treating the underprivileged in Africa. They spent 13 years in leprosy colonies in Africa, raising a beautiful family in the meantime. And when Wayne was president of the International Leprosy Association, he designated me to represent leprosy for the World Health Organization and inspired me to work on that dangerous, ancient disease. And when one day I confessed to Esther I was a little afraid of the leprosy, she, this brilliant and dedicated woman, took one look at me and said, if you have the skills, the training, and the experience, and you're needed, you better step up. So I knew that when this horrific outbreak of Ebola was happening, I had to step up. I had to step up. Even though this outbreak that we now know started in December of 2013 and is still not quite over, this outbreak that has sickened over 28,500 people and killed at least 11,300 that we know of, that devastated <laughs> Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and also affected Nigeria, Senegal, Mali, Spain, Italy, the UK, and the US. Ten countries in three continents. Still, as the World Health Organization and I were preparing for my mission to West Africa, something happened that changed how the world viewed this outbreak and where I would end up going to. What happened was a villain. And I know it sounds stark to talk about villains and heroes, but I think as you hear this story, you'll agree that the labels actually apply. So the first villain in our story, ironically, is a public health manager, a Liberian American, who became exposed to Ebola from a pregnant woman who had died of Ebola. So he was a high-risk contact. He had been with her at her death. The Liberians had placed him under close observation as a high-risk contact. But when he became symptomatic on the 17th of July, he left their care and, against their advice, planned a nearly one thousand mile trip, traveling from Monrovia in Liberia to Accra in Ghana to Lome in, Le in Togo and finally to Lagos in Nigeria. And while he was in Monrovia and in Accra and in Lome, he stayed away from people. But when he got to Lagos, he started hugging the diplomats who met him. He started shaking hands with them. But they noticed that he was quite ill. So they called the nurse stationed at the, at the airport, and she worried about him and tried to take care of him and asked him questions, and he said, no, 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 I've been nowhere near Ebola. No, 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 I have malaria, and showed malarial pills. 
The Nigerians worried about him and took him to one of their finest hospitals, first consultant hospitals on the island of Lagos, where he met a young and wonderful doctor, Dr. Maurice Ibiabuchi. Dr. Morris asked all the right questions. Have you been exposed to Ebola? Have you been at burials? No, of course not, he lies. I have malaria. So Dr. Morris begin, begins anti-malarial therapy and draws the appropriate tests. But the next morning, when he was seen on the July 21st by Dr. Ada, another young and wonderful doctor, he was much worse. The anti-malarial therapy wasn't working. He was having frequent diarrhea. He had fever. He was nauseous. He couldn't eat. She was very worried. And just then, a diplomat who had met him at the airport shows up and says, I got to take him out of here. He's got to go to a, an economic conference in Calabar. She's worried about her patients. She says, no, I don't think so. And she goes and talks to her attending, Dr. Stella, who takes one look at the information from Dr. Ada and Dr. Morris and says, oh, he's not going anywhere. And this man becomes furious. He starts yelling obscenities. He starts threatening, threats of all kinds. And he pulls out his IV, squirting infected blood everywhere. So Dr. Ada and Dr. Morris would be among the very first victims of the lies and bad actions of our first villain. And Dr. Stella, a very brilliant infectious disease doctor and epidemiologist who had stopped this man, would also fall ill. Her actions, despite his protests, despite his bad behavior, included the drawing of blood in, and the notification of the public health officials. She stepped up, just as Esther Myers would have wanted her to. And she sent that blood to Dr. Sunday, at, at the virology lab of Lagos University Hospital. His preliminary studies indicated that it was Ebola, and he went ahead and sent samples on to the Pasteur Institute in Dakar. But just because of what her suspicions were, his behavior, the fact that he wasn't responding to malaria, and his preliminary studies, that was enough for the Nigerian CDC to contact the Ministry of Health and declare an Ebola alert and start an Ebola incident command system. Soon, the, the results would come back from Dakar, and it would be, in fact, confirmed that the man had Ebola. And that day, the 25th of July, he died. By then, they notified the World Health Organization, who sent an amazing young man, <laughs> my friend Dr. David Brett Majors, a Navy doctor like myself, an infectious disease expert, who had been assigned to Geneva, and so he was able to get to the area first. And because of his amazing work, he realized he had the talent, the skills, and the experience, and he stepped up. Many of the people who were victims survived. Unfortunately, Dr. Stella did not survive. But we cannot understate the critical importance of what Dr. Stella did because the arrival in Lagos, Nigeria, of a man actively hot with Ebola, who was lying and deliberately spreading his contaminated body fluids, was a risk not only to Lagos and Nigeria, but to the entire world. Because Lagos is the largest city in Africa. 21 million people, that's three times more than New York City. And it's a major international hub for air, land, and sea. It has an incredibly dense population and a very weakened infrastructure. It's a perfect place for this outbreak to go completely out of control. Because of Dr. Stella's actions and the awareness now that Ebola had spread to a fourth country, Dr. Margaret Chang, the head of the World Health Organization, says, oh, <laughs> oh my goodness, and she put up an emergency committee that would, within a few days, by the 8th of August, declare this 
a public health emergency of international concern. So now, here we are, and we have this villain who's just died on the 25th that we now know had Ebola. What are we going to do to contain this outbreak? Well, the most important thing is to determine who's been exposed, who's a close contact, isolate them for the 21 days, and treat those who might become ill. It was soon determined that 72 people at the airport and at the hospital had become infected, or excuse me, had been in close contact with our first villain. At the airport, Dr. Alex stepped up and with the help of my vivacious friend, <laughs> Dr. Maurizio Barbarici, took control of that part of the situation. Meanwhile, the Nigerian CDC, the Ministry of Health, had coupled together with the US CDC, the World Health Organization, Médecins Sans Frontières, and others in order to identify and treat any contacts from this initial villain. By the 10th of August, we knew of 12 individuals who had become ill from close contact with our villain. That's an outrageously high <laughs> reproductive rate, but it was because he lied and because of his deliberate spreading of his contaminated body fluids. We didn't know that there was a 13th person. We didn't know that the 13th person would be our second villain that you see there in red. And we didn't know that there was a third villain, a malfeasant doctor in a faraway city who would also be infected. We would be oblivious to this until almost the 26th of August when the wife of the malfeasant doctor became ill with Ebola. So what had happened? What is this 13th guy? This was a diplomat who had met our first villain at the airport. He's the same one that had come to try and take him out of the hospital. He had been under close observation. He was a high-risk contact. He did the same thing. Instead of talking to us and going into isolation when he became symptomatic, he turned off his cell phone and he flew 273 miles from Lagos to Port Harcourt to meet up with this malfeasant doctor who should have known better, never, never treated a case of Ebola in his life, but claimed that he could. That malfeasant doctor put this man up in a hotel, never telling anybody that they had an Ebola person at the hotel, treated him there for three days from August 1st to August 3rd, released him back to Lagos, and thought they'd gotten away with it. But eight days later, the doctor gets sick. And this doctor, this malfeasant doctor, continues to see patients, even operating on two of them. Then he gets too sick to keep working. So he stays home for four days, where he's in close contact with his wife, also a doctor, and his ba newborn baby daughter. And all the people who come see the baby. Then by the 16th of August, he's so sick, they take him to hospital. But neither he or his wife tells anybody who's taking care of him that he'd been exposed to Ebola. All the people taking care of him were oblivious. His church members come and did the laying of the hands on him on an Ebola patient. On the 22nd of August, that doctor died with everyone oblivious to his exposure to Ebola, except for his wife, who, when she finally got sick, decided she was a little worried, and she contacted us. Then we were able to find some blood that had been stored on him, and we were able to confirm on the 27th of August that he had indeed had Ebola. This sort of action by these individuals increased the number of people that we were following in Nigeria from 72 contacts to 891. Touching a dead body with Ebola is a very bad idea. And talking about death and Ebola, I need to mention to you that many of the heroes that stepped up in this outbreak also succumbed to the disease. 
In fact, to quote the World Health Organization, an unprecedented number of healthcare workers fell ill with Ebola. 898, too shy of 900. And of those, 513 died. That's a 57.6% death rate in individuals who know the most about how to protect themselves and how to treat themselves from these diseases. This is a horrible disease. And among the 42% survivors, many have post-Ebola syndromes, as do many victims from Ebola. And in some individuals, the Ebola virus can hide in immune-privileged body sites. And we all remember what happened to Dr. Ian Kruiser, who, two months after he had recovered from Ebola, developed terrible eye problems because the Ebola virus was still in his eye, irritating his iris and causing his eye to change colors. And none of us can forget the Liberian woman who became sick and later died of Ebola because she had unprotected sex with a man who six months prior had been declared Ebola-free, a fact recently confirmed by genetic studies. And another study that just came out that shows that as many as 25% of male Ebola survivors still have evidence of Ebola in their semen nine months later, and maybe longer, because the study needs to go on. But the worst part of this story is what happened to another heroic woman who stepped up and went to Sierra Leone to treat victims. This was the Scottish nurse, Pauline Caffrey, who recovered from her episode of Ebola in January, but nine months later, just recently, fell ill with Ebola again, developing neurologic meningitis-like syndromes. This is a game changer. This is really scary, because this is a lot like, think about chicken pox, that could come out later as shingles. So this is a very, very sad situation, and one that makes us have to reevaluate our entire concepts of Ebola, and particularly where Ebola hides in between outbreaks, because for the longest time, we were looking for those animals like bats that get infected but don't get sick. We have to rethink this, and we have to realize that we all share this beautiful planet and that the other creatures and the other people throughout the globe can and do affect us here, wherever here is for us. We cannot isolate ourselves. And while this Ebola outbreak may finally be dying down through all these works, there will be another emerging infectious disease outbreak. And when that happens, we better act as did the countless heroes, some tiny fraction of which are depicted here, did. Because just as Esther Myers said, <laughs> if you've got the skills, the training, and the experience, and you're needed, you better step up. <laughs>